Well, greetings. This is Dr. Dean Blevins, uh, the Kansas City First Church Discipleship Pastor. Uh, welcome back to one more sort of discipleship moment. We're kind of wrapping up a series. Um, so far the, during this series, we've been primarily sort of understanding uh, the life of Jesus in and through the lives of the disciples. Um, and up to this point, we've kind of covered, uh, well, the 12 disciples as we've known them and uh, kind of looked at them in pairs and even took a moment to kind of look at, uh, well, three women that deserve the right to be considered disciples as, as well, um, in Mary, Martha, Bethany, and Mary Magdalene. And so we've kind of moved on beyond uh, just the traditional 12 that we see in the upper room paintings and other places like that. And so I want to kind of wrap up this story, uh, this series of stories by looking at well, one more group, uh, you might think of these as the face in the crowd kind of group, when we talk about the 70 or 72 disciples. Now, why the difference in numbers? Probably the reason is because there were different manuscripts uh, that were being used uh, that, were at, that were fragments of the Gospels, uh, Luke's writing, and in some, they, the, the manuscript would use 70, and others, they would use 72. Um, and uh, if you have, uh, for instance, the New Revised Standard Version, you're going to see the 70. If you have the NIV, you're going to see the 72. Uh, the difference doesn't make that much difference. The one thing we do know, though, is that uh, the difference is probably based on the importance of numbers. I mean, the same way the number 12, when we talk about the 12 disciples becoming the 12 apostles, represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, the 70 do represent probably a list of elders that were mentioned in Numbers 11, uh, 24 and 25, and then 72 is added because in Numbers 11, 26, they also throw in Eldad and Medad, um, two more uh, tribes or elders, excuse me. Uh, and that's probably where this language of 70 and 72 becomes kind of significant for our, our, our reason. More importantly, though, instead of worrying about the number of disciples that Jesus is talking to, I think it's really important to pay attention to Jesus' commission of these disciples. I mean, he starts out with language that actually sounds pretty familiar from other places. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. Um, that's language you'll find in Matthew 9 as well. And there you would think he's talking to the 12 disciples. But in Luke chapter 10, it's to a large array of disciples that he does send out two by two into uh, various places within Judea and, and Israel as a part of this period of time. It's important what he says to them, though, that I think it's really important for us to listen into. First of all, he says, go on your way. See, I'm sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Wolves, So he knows it's not going to be a, um, an easy trip, but it can be a dangerous trip. He says, carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, greet no one on the road, whatever your house, you, whatever house you enter, say peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. And so first he's saying, don't take any extra luggage with you. Go with just the basics of who you are uh, in, in the fullness of just who you are as a human being. When you enter a house, offer hospitality, extend peace. And if they receive it and they invite you in, let that peace rest upon them. But if they don't, well, return that peace to yourself, which means don't be angry. Uh, don't, you know, don't, don't in some ways say anything unkind, but allow that hospitality to merely rest back into who you are and extend that hospitality to the next house you go to. Now, should you remain in the house eating and drinking, he says that, um, that just what you should do is stay there. Uh, as a matter of fact, he says, um, do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town, the people welcome you. Eat what is set before you. Now, why would he say that? Why would he say, if the people invite you in, just eat what they have to offer and don't move around? Well, probably because in this period, there were sort of Jewish um, leaders, and you might call them prophets or evangelists, if you will, uh, who kind of made a living off of doing 
kind of traveling around and sort of offering their religious services uh, for whatever was the best meal available and the most they could get out of it. So yes, much like we'll find later in the history of Christianity, people trying to make a buck, or make money off of the gospel. Um, there were those kinds of people in these days. And Jesus is saying, wherever you land, stay there, receive what you receive, and don't try to just sort of work the town for what's best for your ability. He does say that whenever you enter the town and they welcome to eat there, to also take time to cure the sick uh, uh, who are there and then to say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. Now, I, I hope you hear that that's the very language that Jesus himself used at the beginning of his ministry, right in the first part of Mark. And so he is handing to them what we might call the gospel to extend to that town. Now, he does say that if a town doesn't receive them, just to kind of, you know, wipe off their feet, dust the dust off their feet so they can move on to the next town. But more importantly, even as they do that, he says in verse 11, even as you leave that town that hasn't received you, go ahead and tell to them, by the way, the kingdom of God is coming to you. You still proclaim the gospel. Now, for that town, for those towns that reject the uh, seventy or seventy-two disciples, uh, he says, for them, they, they there may be judgment yet to come. I mean, for them, it won't be any different than what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. As a matter of fact, Jesus, sort of in the middle of this uh, commissioning, launches in a kind of blow against unrepentant cities, kind of cautioning them, and he says something that kind of is sort of foreboding. He says, whoever listens to you, he's talking to the disciples, listens to me. And whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me, which is God the Father. I mean, we could use this as a way of really kind of going off on uh, cities or different kinds of people who do not live faithfully the gospel. But I, I want you to hear it in a slightly different way for us as we think about discipleship, that the way in which we extend the kingdom of God's message really in some ways is merely an extension of Jesus' message, which was an extension of what God is bringing about. And so, yes, people who reject it reject God. But it's not to elevate us, but to give us a really deep sense of our mission is that we are extensions from God to Jesus to our very own lips of proclaiming the kingdom of God has come near and that we have a special commission, if you will, as disciples to make sure that message gets out for the sake of everyone recognizing the possibilities of those who do not hear it, who do not receive this message when we offer it to them. But that's not the end of the story. What's pretty fascinating is what happens. The result of this is that the 70 or 72 actually come back to Jesus and they come back in joy saying, Lord, you know, even in your name, even demons submit to us. Apparently phenomenal things were going on out of the witness. And Jesus then has this really pretty dramatic view of seeing Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning it starts giving them all kinds of authority. And this is where a lot of times, frankly, as we read, because this is about trading on snakes and scorpions, that we hear about, well, some pretty phenomenal ways of discipleship today in our day and age. What is going on here? Well, there is the fact that the 70 come back and go, the good news is the kingdom does happen. When we proclaim this, when we follow what you have come, given to us as a commission, dramatic results happen. And Jesus launches into a kind of what we would now call a kind of apocalyptic, kind of dramatic vision of this is exactly what the future is going to look like, and rejoices with them. And finally says, out of that, he says, at the same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to your infants. Yeah. Disciples, we're all babes in arms from that standpoint. We're just babies as far as, uh, as, far as it comes to that point. Uh, and then says, and yes, Father, as such was your gracious will. So it's not our ability and our power to do something. 
but God at work in and through us. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who, who the Son is except the Father, who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. That's a pretty, a pretty fantastic thing. And then Jesus says, at the end of this passage, he says, turning to the disciples, he said to them privately. So let me pause for a second. Up until now, this big demonstrable uh, statement has probably been happening to a bigger crowd than even the seven. But now he looks and says, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Well, I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. What Jesus is saying at the end of this story is that for these 70 sent out two by two, they have actually been given a taste of what true, not just discipleship, but true apostleship looks like. They've been given an opportunity to see the power of the kingdom of God demonstrated in the world around it. Now that's a pretty powerful vision. And I frankly, we could probably as disciples, uh, we could, as we used to say in the South, hit the big head, think that we all of a sudden are just, you know, we're gonna bring uh, the gospel to everybody and you better watch out if you don't get the gospel from us. What I find interesting is the very next story that, <laughs> that um, Luke chooses to tell coming out of this result is that he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in that parable, if you remember, the one who actually is most like a neighbor and most like um, a caring human being is not the souped up, hyper powered disciple turned apostle. It is the very person that we least expect demonstrating the good news. It's almost as if Luke knows that in our commissioning as disciples and in seeing that kind of result, that we have to be reminded that sometimes, even in our sort of um, desire to be all that we can be for God, we have to recognize that we can't put down other ways God might be at work at the same time. So th I think this is a helpful reminder as we kind of wrap up the story of discipleship of the kind of the commission each disciple receives from Jesus and the kind of powerful results that might occur when we really take Jesus at his word, not out of our own power. And yet, I, I am going to finish with, well, this uh, caution from Luke when it comes to discipleship this final story of this parable of the Good Samaritan, that just the minute we think we have it right, Jesus tends to work in some rather remarkable and interesting ways to wake us up to the fact it's still about Jesus's work and not necessarily about our power and our leadership. Now, I think that's probably a good way to kind of close this study. Um, I, I hope it's been helpful for you. So that whether we begin within, well, impulsive people like Peter, or we are more of the skeptical kind of people like Thomas, or whether we're the hotheads turned into the beloved like James and John, or whether we are, well, sometimes uh, the most obscure people on the face of the earth like Jude um, or James the Lesser, or whether sometimes we really have real decisions that we have to wrestle with, uh, much like, well, very much like uh, Ju Judas Iscariot or Simon the Zealot. Or perhaps, perhaps for some of you, it's much more like, well, the Marys, those who are really, really seen in the background sometimes, but ultimately become the ultimate evangelist. Wherever you are in this story, or maybe you're just one of the 70 or 72. I hope you see this as an invitation to orient your life to Jesus's desires. And in doing so, though, Jesus was doing that out of his desire to follow, follow the will of the Father. And when we do that, amazing things can happen. Amazing things can happen. But only, only as we let Jesus guide us in that journey.
Blessings to you.